So yeah, I'd well, like to give you uh, my welcome first of all. Um, just a little bit out, a little bit about our society. We're um, obviously society affiliated with the UWA Guild, and uh, we've been um, in motion for about four years now. Uh, we published the Perth International Law Journal, which has also been for four years, which uh, generally accepts uh, student contributed works or um, works in our branching out across Australia and uh, from key voices in the legal and academic fields. It's presenting niche and uh, novel topics on international legal issues, contemporary international legal issues. And otherwise we uh, run events like these where we get the chance to speak with some very esteemed uh, uh, people with expertise on uh, relevant international law topics as well. And that's, uh, that's, uh, what, that's what we do. And so we're very pleased to have um, an audience like you turn out. And uh, I will pass you on to Chelsea now. And we'll give you an introduction to our lovely panellists here and uh, hope you find this very productive. so much Austin and thank you everyone who's turned up today. Um, hopefully you've finished up your assignments for those who are studying currently at UWA. Um, our society decided to choose this topic because we see the relevance of this matter in international law um, as there's currently no international law framework, um, at least pertaining to Australia. There are quite a few developments in the EU dealing with regulation and uh, big tech companies at the moment. Um, but I won't talk too much on the topic because we'll leave that for the discussion. But I will introduce the, the panelists today. Firstly, to my left, um, Dr. Julia Powells, who is currently a professor of law at uh, UWA, as well as the director of the Mindanao uh, Policy and Tech Lab. There's Dirk Bonham, uh, who is um, the director of foreign law. Claire. Um, Mould, um, who is uh, currently a lawyer at Cause, and finally Ellie, who is also um, a lawyer. And they will introduce themselves, and I'll first pass on to Ellie. Um... Hi, all. Great to be here today. Um, my background it combines finance, technology, and law. I've worked in corporate finance, I've worked in um, sort of tech commercialization, and more recently in law. A commercial lawyer with Next Legal, which focuses on um, commercial and financial services in the fintech side. Hi everyone, my name is Claire Mould. I'm a senior associate at Cause, Cause Chin Swiska. I work in the technology and IP team, do a lot of work in the IP commercialization space, and recently came back from a comment at uh, the Commonwealth Bank's technology legal team, which is very interesting. So yeah, I've been in, been in the tech law space for probably four years or so, so not too long. Yep, I'm Dirk Feinauer. Uh, I have been admitted in 1992, so I'm probably one of the uh, longest uh, serving on the panel here, but um, uh, basically I've been in my own practice since 1995. I do a mix of corporate uh, commercial and litigious work. I do a fair amount of litigious work. I grew up in Germany, so I speak German fluently. And through that, I was one of the first common law trained, fluent German speaking, fluent English speaking lawyers in the region. And so, even though the firm is small, um, the profile of work that I've done includes representing the German swimming team, doing the world championships back here in 1998, through to working for airlines, um, people in the automotive industry, in computing and matters from Australia into Central Europe, into Asia and into America and have received instructions going the other way. So that's my profile. Hi everyone, um, lovely to be here. My name is Julia. I um, am at law school. Um, how many people here are in the law school out of interest? Not too many. So I studied science and law here and then um, I guess my current work is inflected by different experiences working in legal practice, in policy, um, working for a stint as an accidental journalist, I was at the Guardian for a bit, um, and then returning to uh, a, a, the academy working in kind of tech law intersections. And I've been kind of fascinated by the way that a lot of the areas of law that I was thinking didn't really intersect with my interest in science and technology really are core um, domains, so public law protections, protections that we usually think of the public system, not health and education, and child services and welfare and so on, are now very much tech domains. So that's a really fascinating place to be, and I think, um, you know, whatever background you come from, understanding these sorts of issues is really um, going to be ever more um, you know, dealing in your careers. So 
so it's so good to see people from different backgrounds here. Well, thank you so much. Um, we're very thrilled to have Dr.
English is an easy to learn language, it's easy to speak, but what really matters is why people say things, and what culturally informs their decisions. And those cultural things can be informed by political experiences. So um, the 3rd of October we had the reunification of Germany, and Germany is still deeply traumatised by the events of, and of course Nazi Germany is one thing, but actually by the events of East Germany. And I think it's really not been the subject of much public debate here, just how invasive that was. And that is why when you look at Google Maps, you won't see a lot of German properties uh, appearing on Google Maps because they, they're actually afraid of that and they um, want to value their, um, their sovereignty as individuals more than anything. Um, apart from the general conceptual thing of, well, there's no interna inter international law, we also need to have a look at what is tech because we're looking at tech as only digital. And many years ago, I actually printed it off because I keep forgetting the exact quote and I'm getting old. Um, Isaac Asimov, the um, uh, American philosopher, wrote the three rules of robot law. And we've breached them. And for those that nod, you know them. For those that don't uh, nod, I presume you haven't. And I had to write them down myself. And they are, a robot may not injure a human being or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. First rule. Second rule, a robot must obey the orders given it by humans, be human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. You can tell I didn't bring my glasses. I did bring my sunglasses though. Um, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. So if you think about the fact that we have drones now that can take out a whole lot of people, uh, either individually or collectively, that can spy on people that do things, what we have lost in tech is a value, or what we've not even properly looked at, is a value system of the fact that Technology should be no more than a tool, and we should be in control. In terms of who is we, we need to define what that global union is. Um, and we need to give a, uh, an ear and a voice to the people I think who need to be heard on those issues. So I think for now, I guess my comment is, there really is no international law. I think people have stopped thinking about big picture things. The tech sector is responsible for shutting the focus of people. You know, we don't have big political debates. Um, I think even 100 years ago, you could have vigorous debates about who is a Marxist or a fascist, and this and that, and socialist or social democrat, and you know, they're all through eggs at each other and have a big um, debate. Now people will go, I am this, and then we'll take the interpretations of what that is and we'll ram it down people's throats. But meaningful discourse, how we actually harmonize this apparent global economy in an environment that's not global at all. Uh, there's no global law. Try and break a law here and try and enforce uh, a right somewhere else, you will see that courts will treat things very differently. Quick example, Switzerland, for instance, has rules that prevent you taking evidence from a witness. You can't just waltz to Switzerland and go, oh, Mr. Schmidt, can you give me a statement? Because there might be a serious problem with it. And, of course, we know that the Swiss uh, banking sector prides itself on privacy for all sorts of reasons. So they have a framework around that. Now, if we take it as a given that you can go up to anyone and go, oh, do you mind giving us some evidence on that? And that's not nat uh, naturally a consequence of all. So those things need to be chewed through before I think we can lead to the final points. Wow. Very complicated area. Look, one thing that just comes to my mind is that technology is at the core of, of everything I think, in, our, in our lives. And uh, certainly the regulatory environment, um, it, it needs to catch up with that. You know, we live in a society that was built on uh, you know, tech, democracy, tech democracy, for example. You know, the, the, the human rights, you know, freedom of choice, that type of thing. But technology has moved in such a way that has um, impacted our, uh, the, the choices that we make. So it's, yeah, it's, it's super interesting area. Lots to talk about. Um, but I think that's all I'll say for now. The one comment I'll, I'll pick up on what Julian was saying, um, I think that the boundaries between nation states uh, certainly technology pervades it. So when you have, and I think we'll probably get into GDPR in more detail later, but, but just in terms of this point, a European standard um, enforced by the Irish court, for example, as, as we had the other week, um, could change the way Facebook stores data for its American citizens if they want to process it all in one place. So you, this idea of having um, a standard for Europe and a standard for America and a standard for each different country becomes very, very difficult when you have a multinational tech company that's aggregating data from all. So it, it, there's this, this whole, the boundary between the national and the international becomes a lot more fluid. Um, and I think tech, uh, that, that's a tension that, that will be, become more apparent as time goes on. That's a perfect segue into the question of those just to 
about some terms in terms of big tech. Big tech and tech are the ways we've been used interchangeably when we're referring to big tech. We're referring to companies such as um, Google, Amazon, Facebook, um, companies that have immense market control as well as control of user data. So on that top, on that, on that point, should these companies be held to different standards than other corporations with significantly less control, given their expansive reach um, and control, and therefore should they not no longer be subjected to standard private law frameworks, but should they be governed by uh, public law and uh, international frameworks? And as Ellie mentioned, it becomes really onerous when there are different requirements um, in different continents in terms of standards that must be adhered to. Adhered to. So should there be an international framework um, pertaining to regulation of these oligopolies? So whoever wants to start, start off. Okay. Um, well, I guess at the first instance, I think one of the challenges is that they're currently Some of the areas, you know, when you start law school, you do subjects like contract law, and we all, for over a decade, have been entering contracts that I think defy the basic principles of contract law. Sure, there is a contract generator, but you spend less than a second before you click I agree. So, in any meaningful sense that you have engaged with in terms of that arrangement, you know, I love in, in Germany, some, sometimes we enter it. A meaningful contract uh, when you're um, uh, entering into a sort of something to do with marriage or a substantial purchase of houses, so or there's actually roles of people who have to help you work through what those contracts mean and engage with them. And we engage in contracts, you know, you sign up to a service like Facebook, it's got a red dot on you for longer than any friend. Um, and a level, you know, when you see some of the things they collect, like when you type something in, they think that's big. Embarrassing, you delete it, they keep that. Yeah. Things like that, I think we're not really entering into in a way that is balanced and even and meets standards of um, yeah. protections that are in place, like unconscionable dealing or unfair trading or um, yeah. basics of, of, of offering acceptance. I'd argue you can't even be satisfied there. But there's very little contest, I think, over fundamental. Questions of private law. And the principle, I, I spent some time advising in startups, and I was really struck by the broader um, milieu that they operate in and the advice of venture capitalists and others, which is basically ignore the law until you're big enough to change it um, or to lobby your way through. And um, yeah, I think we have unchecked power loose in the system, and private law is not dealing with it, but I, I would like to re-energise some basic concepts of private law. And then I think we have protections that come from, from public law that can be energised. And international law is a really interesting thing when you have regimes that do um, operate to some extent, but I really take on the points of um, the other panelists about how challenging that can be to, to muddle through. Um, I mean, my, there's a kind of standard drawing of the map of um, regulation between the US where not really an interest in strong regulation because they're benefiting from these companies. Um, Europe, which tries to act as the world's privacy and potentially safety regulator, but honestly, if it had its own Google, it would probably back off. And then um, in the classic map, then you sort of have the um, autocratic regimes. And again, I feel like, what about more and more countries where we're also not making a dime, where we also have, you know, a vision of what technology could be that's empowering for people. Um, and you know, I'm really interested in how the regulatory framework sets up um, entities, startups, and other others in the tech ecosystem to really just be eaten up by the big players rather than to develop different kinds of um, tech platforms that maybe would be more aligned to the kind of values that we, we um, subscribe to. Oh, 
Oh, sorry, I think I should have asked the uh, speaker a question. Do you have a question? Questions towards the end. Oh, okay. Perfect. Right, so just there's, there's a few things sort of floating around. Uh, firstly, the mention of Irish courts. I hold the Irish courts in extremely high esteem because they have now declared that uh, Subway bread is not bread. <laughs> and that was a uh, well overdue finding. And no disrespect to those that like uh, Subway. But um, look, I, I think all these things that I, I touched on before might be a little bit of amplification under this particular heading here. So I think you, you have this idea that somebody comes up with a product and they can sell it anywhere in the world. Uh, you take, I mean, it wasn't a product, but you take the railway, the American railway, that was when you really saw some of the worst commercial behaviour and there were other examples of shipping and so forth uh, over the century when the uh, East India Company didn't exactly um, use the practices that we all find that particularly favourable place in the Trade Practices Act now. We each write our own little laws, and you would think that we're, you know, being humans, we would have this inherent ability and this, this wonderful capacity to solve problems. But there are several clashes. So you've got people who go, I've got this wonderful idea, I'm going to make some money, and some people like it, and they become lobbyists, they become advocates for it, and then things have its own momentum, and then they need money. And then the people who provide the money go, well, how do I spend that and make some money out of it? And they have a very limited, small range of uh, things that they pursue. And then this thing sort of chips along like a train, and I guess that's where the railway analogy kicks back in again. And then you might find that as it impacts things, even things that are sort of starting out with good intent become seriously toxic quite quickly. For example, asbestos did that, even though it's easy to cut and easy to nail together, it wasn't something you want to breathe in. And many aspects of technology, whether they become harmful to your uh, psyche or your uh, economy or whether they become harmful in some other way, kind of need some time to percolate because people need to go, oh, I don't actually think it could do that, and that is probably problematic. And then you need to work out how people catch up to it. And this is where rulemaking and universal standards come in, because what bothers one person doesn't bother another. See, I, the most terrifying thing in the world to me is the US notion of freedom. Because to walk down the street and have a person with an M16 walking up and down, I find personally quite terrifying. It's the last thing on earth that I want. But the Americans go, you know, would say, well, anything that I do, I'm entitled to do, as long as I don't break the law. Well, what is the law? You know, your right to swing your fist stops where? Usually short of my nose, I would have thought. What if I'm just bothered by the sight of your gun? You haven't fired the shot, but it just makes me feel uncomfortable and freaky that if you have a moment of ill judgment, you can just blast away because the people who wrote it wrote it at a time when they thought that mercury was a good idea to use for syphilis and when guns basically had one shot. You know, I mean, if you had to, to, to take down 30 people with a musket, um, 29 people were probably quite ready to shove set the musket into a place where the sun didn't shine soon thereafter. People didn't think about machine guns and those sorts of things. But this is what I mean by all not catching up. And then you go territorially to different jurisdictions. Um, and, uh, you know, problems that are seen as particularly horrible problems because they're discriminatory or they deprive people of rights that are accepted in one jurisdiction really don't resonate in another jurisdiction. They just look at it and go, uh, what's, your, what's your point here? Um, so how do you reconcile that? So I think that the big challenge right now is for the world to talk and for the world to assume some universal standards. And it's done that very poorly in only a few areas. So if we take the sale of goods, you know, there's conventions on, national conventions on the sale of goods, again, try and enforce them. Enforcement is the big problem, because law as an ideal, as a written thing, is lovely and people can parade around it. But until you can actually take it to a place and go, hey, I've got this bit of paper, it means that pal, have this over or do that, an awful amount of pal, um, then uh, it really becomes entirely ineffective. So I think spinning off from that, there, there are some things I think that are worth touching on. I saw on the Amnesty International website that 73.1% of people are concerned about the way that their information is, is, is dealt with. And so I think it's important to, to look at what exactly are these um, you know, old, old, old companies doing. Um, and, you know, it, they're really, I feel like there is, um, you know, I don't have full insight into what these um, entities are doing with my data and um, I think there's a huge education piece um, you know that we need to take on the personal level um, and oh, I'm just really 
you know, I made this judgment. Federal court judge didn't really know what cookie was. You know, the, the a, a judgment. Sorry. Chocolate chip or vanilla? <laughs> so I think the first step is to really, um, you know, educate ourselves and understand exactly what what these companies are doing, uh, and 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 from there we can we can decide. And I think that really ties back to what Julia was saying about the informed consent or contract, which is, is like when perhaps an educated consumer can be a lot more informed when they accept a term of contract and understand what that means. And perhaps, for example, if I'm signing up to Facebook, I would like to see what my data looks like to an advertising company. So what, 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 what do they see, what do they get when they buy my data before I consent? And perhaps it could be different tiers and people could pay to, to become anonymous. Or you, you could have a lot happening within the current frameworks where the contracts are more informed contracts. But, so in short, I think the answer is no, because the current frameworks are not really exploited. Um, and other such frameworks could be, um, for example, um, suing for defamation. Um, that's currently a very complex process. If there was some sort of part of the terms of services, you could have a, a decentralized arbitration panel where it quickly sees a comment, you flag it, and they determine whether or not it should be removed or not. And that could be done. There, there are many, many ways that we can look at the existing frameworks and actually apply technology better. Um, we didn't really address the issue of monopoly. I don't know whether you wanted to go there or not. In terms of monopoly, oligopoly, yeah. uh, we're just referring to the extensive market control that so, these firms have and due to that control, um, that seems to be... So I think that's a separate, so it's a, it's a separate question. So there's yeah. one about um, sort of the, the relation with the consumer and one that's more about the market, mm -hmm. and the, the question of monopoly. Which so is let's dive it to say an economic question. I know the ACCC has made a comment yes, on regulating this. And in the US is the looking into that. Again, that's something I think uh, my concern is that, that regulators freeze in time the way they see the future rolling up. So uh, uh, a legislative action takes a long time to implement and it's frozen in time. And technology is developing at such a pace that you might freeze in time something that doesn't actually make sense. Are you down the track? Are you down the track? And what works better, what has worked, is actually the market. In, in, and I know we may disagree on that, but the, let's say, who here is, is got a MySpace account, right? What? Exactly. And they were, they were in the monopoly position. They had 75, over 75 percent of all social media. Until the Explorer went down and 88 percent or 3 percent when Chrome came around. And Kodak, um, used to be a 95 percent market share, is now part of bankruptcy in, in 2010. Um, Xerox is another example. There are plenty of these examples of, of very dominant uh, companies that, as technology changes, um, become obsolete. So just because Google and Facebook are currently very dominant, that doesn't mean that they'll be in the same place in 10 years' time. Just, just, just quickly on this idea of, of consent and informed consent. So, um, you know, the franchising industry has a uh, code of conduct that requires you to take legal advice. Paperwork's usually this thick. Um, speak to uh, your average ice cream franchisee, and you can explain as simply as you like, they'll just play as over. It's become now, explaining the legal concepts become so onerous that it's become counterproductive to the objective. Because what you need to understand is there's cost going in, there's cost being in, there's cost going out. You're going to buy through a streamed um, uh, thing, the lease is probably not yours, or you may not have sufficient control. Those simple things are difficult to convey. So when you're sitting there and you're clicking about whether or not you want to enter it, the last thing you're going to think about is your contract. Because the reality is, if Facebook is still cool five minutes from now and you want it, um, you're going to click on anything. You're basically going to do whatever it takes, like a, a rat to cheese, um, to, to get that very thing. The problem is how we regulate the right of a person to basically suck 
things that are inherently to do with you, out of you. You know, the ability to, for instance, monitor your consumer behavior, it doesn't matter if it's a Google or a Facebook, the data collected on you will accumulate on some service, blockchain, otherwise, somewhere in the world until that information becomes the thing of value. So instead of Google being a search engine or so, it becomes a purveyor of profile creation. Now, there's a fascinating documentary I saw the other day, the name of which escapes me, again, probably due to my age, but uh, the idea of it for one of the presenters in the documentary was, well, let's just turn everything off and have a conversation. Well, by the way, how are you going to have a conversation when you turn everything off? You know, things become very regional. So the idea is actually now to try and elevate the human condition, I think, to robustly regain, by, by robustly, robustly, I still mean in a courteous way, a conversation about how the world should look. Is it actually a problem that somewhere out there is some depersonalized data about whether or not you buy, you know, shorts or whether you buy three quarter length pants or whatever it is? Is that a problem? Do we fear the government collecting data or do we fear somebody sitting in a country that has no regulation at all basically up to monitor the you know, monitor everything you do? You know, who's, who do we fear the most and what regulations do we need? That needs to happen, and you're the generation to do it. You know, I'm sort of in the autumn of my life, and we're going to turn my toes up soon. Um, but um, but the idea is that it's it's really for you to kick that around. So many ideas discussed, and as you can see, we have an ideologically diverse panel that doesn't necessarily agree, which is a great thing because we're all for civil discourse um, here. I'll I wish I begin. Maybe I'll start with the notion of informed consent as well as the notion of the oligopoly. I think here we're not too focused on market share from an economic perspective. It's, a, it's more a discussion about power and the extent of control, not just market control, but control over lives that these companies have. And that leads to our next series of questions, and I think I'll combine the two about data rights, but in terms of informed consent, I think most people underestimate what they're agreed to with the terms and conditions and it's, it's honestly not feasible to even read these terms and conditions because they're so, so extensive um, and therefore like, are you actually consenting to a valid contract are these valid contracts where you're signing away your data rights and i think surely you'll agree there's the state of lawlessness to quote yourself in terms of how these tech companies are operating so when we're talking about the notion of an oligopoly we're talking about immense power that's been derived from user data and therefore it becomes a matter of public interest. So um, I, uh, everyone has a lot to say so I'll move on to the next question. To what extent are these tech companies threatening data rights and how do we ensure data rights are protected? I know DERP is pretty critical of I guess the notion of international law and it is true international it's difficult to enforce because it tends to be soft law. Um, but you know, can we create frameworks that better protect our rights and what current frameworks exist? Um, who would like to start us off? <laughs> Fantastic moderating, I think, Chelsea. Um, I, I just can riff off some of these great points that have been made. I mean, I think that question of I, I want to kind of trouble some of the ideas that tech companies lay out for us. So some of them are to think about literally all the information about you as something called data. It's pretty desensitizing in itself. Um, another is the sort of use of the individualistic idea of what we're doing when we um, engage in platforms for about communication um, to make it an individual choice. And I use the analogy when we enter physical spaces, we don't individually make a choice as you cross that door. Do I want to look at all the terms and conditions and make sure that this building has met all the standards and codes and am I signing up? And basically anything goes because I want to you know, suck that good thing. <laughs> Dirk's saying, no, you don't. You, you, as, you trust that there's a bunch of regulations, standards, codes, laws that are in place and you don't need to trouble yourself with them because someone else is. And I think in the digital world, we're starting to see none of that is in, in place. And I might mention here a few of the, what really helped me, I think, in thinking about um, technology was to 
see the voices of people who are always the people who are affected by, um, uh, you know, at the, at the kind of edge of social change and then um, tend to be communities, minority communities, women, people of colour, people who have been traditionally marginalised. And a lot of those voices have been saying for a long time, when we use platforms that become kind of natural monopolies and are, um, part of these dominant um, frameworks, they tend to have behaviours that have massive harm to people who are marginalised. So there was a um, famous set of pieces by uh, a number of African American women about how when you do search on non-Caucasian names, it comes up with, for example, prison records. It comes up with, if you search for black girls on Google, it comes up with child pornography. And the consequences of some of those things, I think, are for all of us to contemplate. Um, because those ideas that get put out there, that you know, we all need to make a choice and we can transact our data and we want to use these platforms and we trade off, have collective consequences. So I increasingly see ideas like digital rights, data rights, privacy as very much collective or environmental kind of considerations. What kind of environment do we want to live in? And you know, without a mechanism for some of those global conversations that I agree with, it would be wonderful to have. I think we need systems that ensure that there are protections that are for um, society's most disadvantaged, for the consequences that we know play out. Um, another context, quite separate, that I'm interested in is the use of technologies like data analytics and AI in health. And you know, there's huge promises made about it, but these systems are trained on mass data sets. And they're trained on mass data sets that, sets that are uniform in how, um, and the kinds of people who are in health systems. And so again, they perform very poorly in um, non-Caucasian communities. And I'll list a couple of books and then pass them on. Um, Sophia Noble, Algorithms of Oppression. It's a wonderful book that introduces some of these ideas. Kathy O'Neill's got a great book, Weapons of Math Destruction. Um, there's a mighty tome called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff. You know, there's lots of amazing work out there. And I think um, what is so fascinating to me about tech is I don't know any other domain where people kind of have ideas about it and how it should be dealt with and that the government's not doing enough, or courts are too slow, or regulators to come at like they do in tech. I don't hear that about bridges or about houses or about cars. But somehow we all, because we interact with tech, I think we feed the beast, we think we know the beast, and we can't quite solve the beast. So, um, yeah, I think it's a great area to, to really learn from people who've been studying it and um, subject to it for a long time. Yeah, I'll probably start um, just with the way we have conversations about things and the way we label things. So we look at data and it becomes a beast of its own. Like, ooh, data. And it's not data, it's this big thing that lives down the road somewhere and might be accessible or not accessible. So in, in a much former life, in a much earlier life, and the life I described as 30 kilos ago, I used to teach martial arts. And one of the things I was the women's self-defense instructor at ANU, and I had to teach people within a 10-week program how to actually defend themselves. And also then there was the issue of weapons. And the most important lesson in our style of teaching was that a weapon is an extension of the body. In other words, the tool is just a tool. You lose it, you drop it, it doesn't matter. This is just, this gives you reach, this gives you the ability to cover whatever it is. And I think technology, whether it be a hammer, the wheel, um, steam engine and all the rest of it, is really just an extension of what we need to do. It, it should amplify what we do. And that's what data is all about. Data is just people going, oh, this is a really cumbersome way of filling out forms, and I can't I just digitise that, and then it became this, and then it became that, and so forth. So I think we need to, uh, I think in that, do two things. One, we need to lose the fear of what it is, and we need to stop otherizing it. It's part of our life. And whether it's digital or non-digital, technology will always be part of us. Um, I think the problem is it's just become so big, so invasive, so quickly, that in a world where I think we've won, lost, lost the ability to have a robust uh, discourse with each other. Actually, that idea is really terrible. I think that's a better idea. And, and have a polite conversation. So we grow, you know. 
some people criticise because they actually want to make a positive change. I'd like to think I want to rise. Follow me on LinkedIn, you'll see me criticise as well. But the, um, the, the fact is that you've got to think it all through. And until you can take it somewhere, so you, let's say you have a domain name dispute. That's probably actually the coolest area of a dispute. You have a domain name dispute, and that area has actually sorted itself out. Because you go to Wipe, or you go, I really don't like what they're doing, I've got this right and that right, and then on paper, Whoop -whoop, it's sorted and it's reasonably inexpensive and it's done and it's one of the very very few things in your commercial life that will actually do that and so with data and with that information you know, I've, I've been stalked by some well you know obviously if you have an opinion my uh, enemy but somebody's uh, basically um, you know been on my back for the last 10 years so I have to stand with Google now for, for a long time as a Google Australia as a Google America um, we've got the IP address it turns out it's uh, VPN and that sort of thing. So, you know, there's things that kind of grow from it and they're quite tedious. But I should just be able to go, look, Google, look at the terms and conditions. This person was never a client of ours. You say you have to be a client, take it off. And Google basically goes, I don't care. And then you write to the ATRC and they go, I also don't care. And I think those are the things that we really need to work through. So, you see it in the environment, let's just take it out of the digital uh, forum for a minute. And there's some shocking things that happen in the uh, in, in the environmental space, absolutely appalling, and we can all see it. You know, the stink rises, the clouds are black, bad. I mean, that you know, the, the, the digital rubbish in Africa and so forth. This should be something where, at the click of a finger, we have this problem lick, and we don't. Again, I think, and I don't want to sound sort of too circular. We need to accept that I think it's all part of our existence. We need to define who we are. I think. We also need to learn to maybe abandon some of the tags that were given to all of us a hundred years ago because I hate being labelled. I feel strongly about environmental things. I have my own business, you know, so I, in that sense I'm a capitalist, I'm a materialist to your point, but I hate waste. Um, there are things that come naturally on the one front that would categorise me as this, and I can't be that because I need to go into that box. I think we need to stop that. And with tech, because it's so pervasive, we just need to find a new language and a new big picture. And then we need to convince everybody who's using it to subscribe by, and that's when we start making a difference. We'll discuss that concept of creating a new language towards the end, but um, we'll finish off in this and then we'll... Um, sure, sure. Oh, it would be great if technology was just a tool. I think we've hit a point now where it's just it's so much more than that and it's uh, you know it's, it's it's making us do things that we wouldn't ordinarily do. I read somewhere where when we've now become uh, hackable animals and so you know I agree with you we need to you know understand who we are and uh, you know thinking about our um, you know human rights the, the freedom of expression it's all very well and good, but what is what are our expressions based upon? Are they based on misinformation, disinformation? Um, it's 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 a really it's it's quite a scary space, and I think um, the documentary you we were referring to, um, social dilemma. I think, yeah, I think that's that. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's shown us how yeah these the these big tech companies are are threatening our our rights and. Um, yeah, I just, I lived in London for a while and I don't know if anyone who's been to London has been to Speaker's Corner. It's a place where you could just turn up on a Sunday morning and listen to people express controversial thoughts and, you know, you could walk past and just ignore it or you'd stay and engage. Um, you know, you, you, had a, you had a choice about what you did with that information you were being um, told, but with Social media, for example, uh, you know, the, the keyboard warriors, they have this, they have this voice and um, you know, depending on your engagement with that voice, you have shown uh, more of that content and it's, oh, yeah, the disinformation space, it's quite, quite scary. Is that what you... No, 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 you don't. So we didn't really delve too deep into data rights protections, but when we're considering the rights, of course, um, you know, Claire did mention human rights, the right to privacy, and those sort of um, 
international law frameworks that can cover um, threats to data rights as we see it now, but um, as to if we need a further framework, an uh, international law framework that sets out the standards. Because as Dirk was saying, it's not enforceable. I, I do think there is merit in having standards to, to strive towards. Um, I think we do need to be a little bit idealistic um, in the world we live in, so we have benchmarks that we can um, you know, um, try to meet to some extent. But that's moving on to the next question. And Claire did mention you know, um, this issue of tech companies being a threat to democracy in a way. I don't really say um, the current environment now, the tech environment, is an existential threat to de democracy. I don't really make those sort of sweeping statements. But um, I'm sure you, some of you who was aware of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Um, so that was one of the key So that's back to the informed consent. So, so when it comes to that sort of data, I think there are two types of data. There's one that's personal data that identifies you as an individual. And then there's this, I think the term is surplus data, basically when they identify, you know, male, 40 years old, or by category, they say, based on a, a whole, that's where the collective comes from, based on a whole group of people like me, what do they do? For one example of that, and that collective information, while it's not invasive, can be quite um, eerie. So the, the famous story in Walmart, they predicted this teenage girl who was, came into the shop and was start, start, started getting the mail brochures about pregnancy-related items. The father freaked out, why is this is my, my daughter, and later found out that in fact she was pregnant. The way they figured this out is that she switched her shampoo from fragrance shampoo to non-fragrance shampoo and combined that decision with her age and etc. etc. Et they, they figured out that she must be pregnant. Right? So they so that generic data has got quite invasive powers, but it's not individually invasive. So so I, I'm less concerned about that, even though it does can lead to these sort of results. But certainly the private data, I think that should be governed by a clearer consent framework. And that could be perhaps a 30 second video when we sign up explaining how to do the terms of contents. I mean, they're great at marketing everything else. They, these social media companies can market themselves. I mean, they market uh, brands and they market everything in, in 10 second videos or 30 second videos. 
why have they have to do so with the contract? And, and also to be able to see what your profile looks like and what is actually being sold. So I think once you do that and you have a user who's actually inf giving informed consent, then I'm not going to deter, I think that's for them, I'm not, I think going beyond that is paternalistic of trying to actually say, no, you should not consent to that. Because the reality is if we ask around, how many of us are prepared to pay, let's say, $10 a month, but for Facebook not to have any information about us, most of us are not paying. 90% of them are not paying. So people don't value privacy as much as they like to talk about it. Ah, so back to the question, <laughs> fake news. So again, I think it's a, it's a delicate balance. I think the balance, for, I would say, is, is on the individual. And if we can flip the model, where perhaps a lot of things get published, but we are able to say filter, and perhaps by, by political ideology or whatever, whatever sort of filter you want, you could switch on far right, far left, um, you know, um, medical misinformation, whatever it is they want to filter, but have the individual be able to do so. I think that would be a better feature than having the central authority, be it Facebook or a government, determine what is true and what is false, because then that they become super powerful um, in, in being able to control the information that we see. And if we are able to have those tools to do so ourselves, I think that would be better. You know, obviously there are limits to that. There are things, you know, public health and, and so on, that maybe they should be forced to show whenever there's a disinformation or conspiracy theory, so to show another YouTube video that debunking this thing, right? And that could be something that's done by the companies uh, themselves rather than through um, draconian regulation. So to what extent do these data companies then take that over? First of all, it comes back to this idea that I think data is not a foreign body, I don't think companies are inherently evil, I think just stuff gets away. And the way you manipulate processes can happen with people stealing ballot boxes, and they can be by pushing the people who have the voting sheets for this party out of the way in favour of another party and all the rest of it. So uh, for me, regulation is important in that area. Who will regulate it? Um, the idea that you show a YouTube video to straighten up a fact, well, that, the assumption is that the publisher of misinformation has a capacity to correct that information 
And that level of self-regulation, I would almost bank on would never work. And I just think doesn't doesn't fly. So uh, I think we need to find a universal standard. Ask yourself why in the United States you can buy a machine gun but you can't buy a Kinder Egg. You know, because you could swallow what's in the Kinder Egg. Well, there's less Kinder Eggs killing people than bullets. So those are the sorts of things and then we apply that. But I'm very much in favour of regulation. Uh, and I think, do you need to break these companies down a lot? You need to have meaningful enforcement. Just a quick point too. You click onto most contracts. It takes your rights out of the court system anywhere and puts it into the arbitration system and the method of resolving the dispute over which you have little control. That's another problem. But anyway, there's lots to talk about. Yeah, happy. Well, um, I think since you didn't want to speak to say another, but I, I definitely do think social media platforms are undermining democracy. I think election integrity in this US election um, blockchain is not, absolutely not guaranteed. I think the way that the platforms operate does continue to allow, they have nothing like in the finance sector, that you, you check, um, you know, know your customer rules, that you don't have completely bad content being pushed to people with political preferences that should not be known to, the, to those that are pushing it. So um, I want to recommend there's a great um, intervention from the people that brought you Cambridge Analytica um, of a stunt oversight board, a real Facebook oversight board, launched on the 1st of October, it's reporting weekly for the next 10 weeks. And it's a great um, summation with many international experts of the issues that are currently playing out around um, Facebook and the election. And it makes very clear demands, like banning political ads and ensuring that particular content is taken care of. The only other point I wanted to make, and it's interesting, it gives us, I think from this part of the world, several interesting points of departure is how it actually works. So you gave the example, Dirk, of um, you know, having someone hiding behind anonymity who continues to you know, do conduct, behave in a way that you wouldn't allow them in the public space. And the, um, the way that that's responded to by the major platforms, I think, is fundamentally a change. I think that they should only scale as much as they can manage. You've never had companies of this scale and like such a poor um, employment base to be able to deal with the problems that they're dealing with. So they are decisions that need to be made according to national law by people who are trained properly and who are protected. And our part of the world is where a lot of the people doing that work of content moderation live and work. So they're contract labourers in the Philippines, in India, and they are subject to terrible conditions. Can you imagine looking every day at the absolute base of human self-expression? So, you know, and we even have it here at the UWA. I was talking to the social media person, she gets Three times as much the content that she looks at is beheading videos and child pornography. I mean, it's UWA news, like nobody even really follows them. So there's this whole, I think, invisible layer of human suffering that we, through our social media experience, um, continue to support. And um, you know, I think that's that kind of recognising that labour base that supports um, the current mode of the platforms, I think, would be a way to get out. Well, how we could actually have a better way that reconciles this challenge between freedom of expression and you know, other protections that are essential, freedom of assembly, so that you don't have the scenarios of political dissonance and always being targeted, um, but also just civil discourse. Bug. <laughs> um, can I just, sorry, I do want to add one thing there because you make a really powerful point. Um, I think it goes further, I think, with tech companies too, and then I made a comment about not just focusing on them. I think you really need to have deep-seated regulation of the electoral process. You know, in America, just to qualify for presidency, and I think this year has not been up, yield the best candidates. Um, and you, you, in fact, I think all Americans are voting on who's, you know, who's the less real evil. I, I could be wrong on that, and I might get more death threats. But um, the, uh, uh, you know, the idea that you can really run on the merits of what you say um, and make it accessible, and I think we are so lucky here in Australia, there's areas for improvement. But that's something that has to be confronted because just categorically saying, well, you undermine by saying this and saying, well, there are people that have tremendous commercial advantages, whether it's on tech or otherwise, and I think that is an inherent problem. Look, one of the issues is the moment Facebook is considered to be a platform under Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act, 
the platform as opposed to a publisher does not take responsibility for anything that happens on its, on its infrastructure. So for example, you can imagine a phone company, uh, if I'm doing a drug deal on the phone company, you wouldn't expect the phone company to be in any way liable for that. Whereas the West Australian, the West Australian publishes a story about me which is defamatory, I can sue them. I can, I, they, they are liable for that, especially in Sydney. Um, what the, the more the, the reason why they currently consider to be a platform is because they have such a minimal touch, right? The problem is if they become um, if they start determining what is true and what is fake news, for example, if they start um, being a bit more um, selective and effectively acting like a publisher, like a newspaper, they then become liable for um, anything that that's, anyone says on the site. So that's, a, that's obviously for a company like that, the blue mini publishers and all of us uses it as mini publishers and Facebook being liable for what every single person uh, potentially says about somebody else would potentially, um, would not work with business models. So that's something that has to be uh, worked out of how to figure that out in platform and publisher. And in that time, I'm quite happy to what we're discussing. Absolutely. I don't think, think self-regulation is, is the answer. I mean, true and false isn't always black and white. And be quite a subjective thing and also uh, you know it takes resources to set up a team to check what's false and, and, and what's not so I, I certainly am I'm in favour of uh, you know um, you know broader broader regulations like we need to go back to basics and look to human rights you know basic human rights to help steer um, in this opportunity with a principles based a principles based approach can I just speak to the platform? I'm oh, sorry, one, one more thing because I'm. Oh, it's on. Um, <laughs> it's trying to be No, no, no. It, it is one of my bugbears, you know, this idea that tech companies are just platforms because I really think that's the case of the emperor's new clothes. Um, if I invite you into this room, uh, it's my invitation. I'm responsible for you. University has a huge effect on me. The point is that I think your point, you know, there really has to be some ownerships and responsibility and to make it meaningful. And, and the dilemma being that, you know, you can't sit there and go, it's just a platform. If you become a platform for hate, if you become a platform for child pornography, you're not a platform. You're not like a phone company. A phone company enables communication. It's a conduit. It's a, it's a cable, basically. A platform like, to use the wider term, like a digital media company that allows you to go into print to have your remarks there to be read and reread. At least at the point that you put on notice, you should be able to be accountable there and there, and it should be easy. You shouldn't have to worry about security for costs in this jurisdiction doing this and all the other things that go with enforcing laws, which are horrible things. But that needs to be regulated. So I think tech companies, in that thing, they need to start growing up on that, and I think they need to start to mature. I think people need to really grapple with the issues, get on their backs, and go, put your put people's pants on, answer to this, you know, you say you're that, what do you actually mean? Just kill off some of the fluff. There's a lot of stuff that's just been spouted out by people go, what does this mean? You know, go back to the basics. If it's written, it stays there, you are accountable. So we've agreed that these companies should be held liable. What is the scope of that liability? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, there are but we have diverse opinions. Um, so what is the scope of this liability? And as Dirk said, you know, these can't just be platforms with hatred. I think you may be aware of the issue in Myanmar with the Rohingya um, Muslims and how um, the phone tech industries working there where they sell mobile phones at street stands and they upload Facebook. I'm not who's aware of the internet.org initiative by Facebook. Um, that's again, this, these sort of issues overlap with ethical considerations as well. And when we're talking about regulation, it's not regulation in, in an economic sense to stifle innovation. It's regulation to protect notions of democracy. Um, as Julia would agree, and I will say it, it doesn't matter if I sound a little bit um, sweeping in what I'm saying, that I think democracy is certainly being undermined by the extent of control these tech companies have. Um, and it's not just an economic question, it's a political one. So given that most of us have agreed that these um, big tech companies should be regulated, and you've attempted to answer to what extent, um, we've agreed that 
there should be some monitoring of the content. Um, it just becomes incredibly difficult. So before I move on to the final question, which is off the tangent a bit, um, what do you have to say finally on regulation? What framework do we aspire to? Um, do you, any of you want to mention what's happening now with EU in terms of their regulatory framework that they've implemented and what approach should Australia take as well on this front? Whoever wants to start off. Everybody's excited. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've seen, uh, certainly with encryption and blockchain, and I don't want to get into that a bit more here, but uh, the concept of self-sovereign identity, or people actually owning their own data, and being able to port it from one, from one uh, platform to another. So I think that would be an important thing. Once a user actually has a wallet, they basically, so that all of the data is controlled from that, and they give permission. Um, like basically when you install an app, right, and you have this app wants permission to the location, your photos, um, you know, something simple like that, and being able to say this platform wants access to every single movement that you do, <laughs> then you might choose yes or no. Uh, so, so that that is certainly a trend that I think uh, will, will be growing, or I hope will be growing, and um, and I think users really need to be a bit more informed and take these decisions uh, upon themselves. And I think the more um, as we have these forums and as we educate consumers about uh, what is actually happening behind the scenes, uh, hopefully more and more users will seek these from the product, from the, from the platforms, and the platforms will have to accommodate uh, to these events. Yeah, I agree. Certainly needs to do the um, take more responsibility for, for, for the way they interact with these big tech companies. Um, so on the assumption that the user is technologically literate, um, you know, in many cases they're, they're often, often not, so I still think that there absolutely is an obligation on the big tech to you know, be transparent in their communications, not create complicated uh, terms, um, you know, it's just about the purpose for which they're using information for. Um, oh, the question of how we regulate money. To, to be part of that process. It's certainly, certainly a complicated way, but absolutely needs to be done, and I think we're heading in that direction. I'll hand over to Julia and uh, just to direct the discussion. If Julia or Dirk want to talk about the EU regulatory framework and whether we can implement a similar framework internationally, of course it can't be enforced, but as a standard on tech regulation, Dirk. Uh, look, as, as far as the European models are concerned, um, you know, one, the European Union is, of course, more internally diverse, but it, and, and in terms of, um, it, it might create one law, it's, it's, it's actually, to speak of European law, it's also another, another topic altogether. But there are things you can do in Europe, for instance, you can ask for them to erase some of your history and so on. When you think about that, it kind of kills the purpose to why you have information. So I chased a fraudster into um, Switzerland once, and he was a true bad egg. And the nice thing was that ultimately what, what kind of killed him financially and economically and, and cut his tentacles, he went off to Cyprus in the end where you can't really extradite him, um, was that people could Google him. People could actually look him up. And he was, you know, he'd, he'd curated this enormous image around himself. And he had this fraud guy where he was going around the world telling people he can get finance at a really advantageous bank-to-bank -bank lending rate and would kind of take a commission. And he'd write to him and go, where's my money? And then he would just engage in folders worth of correspondence for over years. And he did, have, he did this all over the world. He, he had a really good business card. Um, not in the end because his wife actually did get shot and killed by somebody as they missed him, but that's another story. So do you want to really remove um, all the data? I think the point is we are writing logs about ourselves. We are creating history. Data is a good thing. Fact is a good thing. I'm a student of history. The more fact you collect, the better it is. So this idea of curating it, the Europeans might stray into will need to be thought about. Because again, we need to have a conversation about what is the society we want to end up being? And what is the data we want to access? You know, do we really want to have a world where people can take a photo of you, you know, in your swimwear, in your backyard to create a map? But then if the photo doesn't exist, how am I going to find the house? You know, what are the compromises? In medical tech, um, 
isn't it a good thing that we create profile, profiles of people? Because if you're really, really sick and you can't speak for yourself, um, people can maybe access that and find it. So yes, I think there, is, there are advantages to um, what Europe are doing. I think that there are disadvantages to it. I don't know if we want to run in and necessarily adopt it. We need to have a robust conversation about what the enforcement landscape should be here. And when we're at a, at a point where we need to have a real argument about whether copyright material that's commercially sold by somebody should attract a charge by the person who only uses that over and over, then you can start seeing the difficulty we really have in putting the wheels in motion. These things should be a lot easier and I'm hoping we'll, we'll make some advances here soon. I'll give a very brief um, point of history on a couple of legal concepts that have come through. So one is the Section 230 idea, which is an American idea from the 90s, um, with, a, with a precedent before it, but around um, intermediaries, internet intermediaries not having to be liable for content, as Eli says, in order to be able to facilitate a wide range of speech. And I think that that works, as you say, Dirk, in the US context, people groan on the teat of free speech. They think anything goes, you're in a public space, you can yell at people, um, and unless you call fire, it's okay. And we have different ideas around free speech. One of the um, you know, US imperialist strikes has been to continue to promulgate an American idea of free speech and this legal fiction of a platform in international spaces. At the same time, in the mid-90s, you had in Europe um, the Data Protection Directive, still the core body of now what's the GDPR. That origin story is a really fascinating one to dive into about these really quite visionary discussions in the 60s about computers the size of this room and the consequences of building files and collecting some of these aggregates of data on people and the sensibility of people who lived through the Stasi who lived in different contexts, different political contexts, I think shaped how that particular body of law came about. I think there's some promise in it. The problem is it has this core idea that every, sort of to be comprehensive, it suffers because it, it overreaches and underreaches because it strictly regulates and controls every use of data, because it doesn't want to make these boundaries. And that's one of the places where if I was to think um, kind of creatively, and I want to create one of Eli's ideas about this, you know, what if we could choose your own algorithm on a platform like Facebook? You could toggle and you could understand transparently who it is developing my news. I think the way to get there is to recognise that, they, that tech companies are custodians right now of data that they, didn't, that they don't own. There's no ownership that's spontaneously generated when you sign over terms and conditions. There might be some contractual rights, but I think that you are effectively custodian of someone else's personal information. And from that, you have a deeper route from, I think, um, governments to be able to make some of those interventions that bring forward accountability and transparency and intervention. And the one other one I think we could do is to um, recognise that Facebook profits, profits from hate, profits from crime and to start looking at proceeds of crime on a mass scale. Mm -hmm. If you start doing that, I think they'll come into a change of platforms too. They're two angles, I think. They have their origin more in the public and international <coughs> sphere, and they're very promising. Fantastic. We're going to go slightly off the tangent now, and as Ellie mentioned um, cryptocurrencies beforehand. Um, so in terms of answering this question, I will start with you and Bradshaw. You may know Facebook actually launched their own Libra um, relatively recently, and Ellie did mention um, the use of blockchain um, even in providing data security um, in some sense. So this question is going to be vague, but can you just talk about developments in that space and broadly um, the legal tech implications and uses? So I think if we go zoom out a bit, not just on cryptocurrencies, but decentralized finance in, in general, um, which is commonly known as DeFi. Um, there's two trends that are happening, and that's digitization and decentralization. And the combination of those two trends, for in, in, in both in finance and in commerce, um, have a lot of potential. So in finance, when you digitize a, and decentralize a process, it means you cut out the middleman, you cut out the bank, you cut out the insurer, because the insurer just performs a function as a trust, as a trusted party between um, the, the two counterparties, parties, the person who takes the risk and the person who wants to cover the risk. The banker is the same between the deposit holder and the, and the, and the person who wants to know. Um, the person who deposits the funds and the person who wants to pull the funds. But you could 
actually do this using technology as your, as your intermediary. And that's what we see now, basically, with parties actually trusting the process rather than a party. So they're not trusting an individual party, they're trusting the process. That's basically what's behind Bitcoin, behind all of these um, um, blockchain technology. So that's certainly a trend that is currently heating up. And what you could start seeing situations where basically you, let's say you're ordering a product to be made in China, it goes from the distribution, it gets, um, once it leaves the factory, you know, a smart contract pays the wholesaler their, their share of the funds, an inspector, a trusted oracle proves um, that it's of certain quality. As the items it may have IoT, it may have some um, sensors on it, so it, as it reaches the port, you know, that now you have to engage a shipping company, you tell them we're, we're, we're on, on time, the insurance gets, gets paid, all of this can happen automatically. Um, without you know the manual steps along the way. And and you go you go down the chain and basically uh, all the way down to distribution. But the, the beauty of this is that it can also handle things like um, so one of the companies I advise on has it's a, in the safety space. And what when you have a smart contract to go out the supply chain, a product recall becomes much easier because you know at any point in time where every single item is potentially Uh, whereas at the moment, our vehicle is an extremely expensive process. Um, so things, things like that will become more and more, um, will, will grow. So that's, um, the other trend that's happened there is, uh, we interesting development is the Chinese E1, right? The Chinese uh, renminbi currency has got a blockchain-backed crypto version. Um, if those developments grow and if they replace, for example, the SWIFT banking system, um, you can start seeing a lot of implications for the predominant international law, particularly, let's say, embargoes, um, that will not actually be able to be maintained, especially by the US, because the, the control of the SWIFT banking system and, and uh, gives the US a lot of leaders, um, whereas if you had an alternate system, um, you could potentially see could you could see bad actors using that as a as a platform. Or it could arguably people could say it could be a good thing because the US would, would you know the power would be checked. Um, but we we're not quite clear how that will develop. Um, so those are a few ideas on the topic.
yes, look, there is something new we can do. One of the big problems is that I think we tend to look into new areas without getting our houses in order. So right now, um, we know from recent news, almost a trillion US dollars has left Africa uh, in illegally uh, siphoned off funds. The impact to the development of nations of that sort of withdrawal of funds is absolutely obscene. I really don't think people need to buy more empty mansions in London at this point in time, which are going to grow and will survive without. Um, the um, banking sector here has just been caned for you know millions of transactions notified late. late. So this idea of bank bashing, and so again it comes to otherizing things, giving you know politicians do this, bankers do that. So people will do whatever they do, then it kind of gets away from them. Some people are unethical, some people are more ethical. The point is you do need a level of regulation. Um, Bitcoin really is just another form of currency. The blockchain system is just another form of verification. It's not like we've entered a new universe and we need to all you know, adapt to that universe. It is an extension of what we do. But I would like to see that we have some regulation over this issue. I'm very concerned about the misuse of new forms of barter, new forms of currency uh, in areas of white slavery, child exploitation, um, you know, because these are the big things that I think we have to answer to right now. And our financial sector and the accountability for money and the application of money for proper purposes, including in areas like product recall. You know, how do you go when the cargo sits somewhere in the deepest, darkest spot where there is lawlessness? You know, how do you get your cargo back? Who do you complain to? Which server has which information? All those sorts of things. So I think, again, we need to... Before you run, you need to walk, and before you, you know, walk, you need to crawl, and before you crawl, you kind of probably have to lie on the floor and just go do do gaga for a while. These are develop <laughs> developmental steps, which if you miss that, the child will kind of leave you a little bit of pity, and I think in the digital work, a bit of do do gaga is probably a good thing. I'm happy to go to questions. Perfect. Um, we don't have all day, but if we do have a few questions, and particularly directed to certain Panelists. Um, I know, Edward, you had one earlier. Uh, I did, but it's not so much a question of law as of uh, axiology and ontology. Uh, so if the questions of law want to go first. A friend of mine was discussing ethics, because I love to be, and there are a lot of ethical questions in terms of um, big tech and creating singularity in terms of you know, mind-body philosophy. So I guess now's the time if you want to go a bit off the tangent, but not too much on, off the tangent. Well, I think it encompasses the tangents in a sense because I'm zooming out quite a bit um, to, the, to the whole panel. Um, the concept of law, systems of law, and individual laws are themselves technologies. Given the disunity of global order, are cultural voting blocks of state actors not themselves technologically oligarch... Uh, what's the word here? Oligopolis. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wrote it down correctly. <laughs> Can you use your words? I beg your pardon? Can you summarise it? Summarise. Uh, right, right, yes. Um, given that law and laws are technologies themselves, um, I, I was asking whether it, it was a reasonable question that we considered, that, uh, we considered uh, um, stepping back from the idea of technology being di a digital technology in um, investigating international technology law. Uh, more specifically, considering uh, state actors and their beliefs about individual laws and legal systems uh, being uh, oligopolies. Do, do you believe that there is a system of, of uh, philosophical oligopolies determining these laws and how so? I think the, the evidence of that is in the discussion we've already had, and we're very American centric in terms of, you know, does this fly in America kind of imposes its will? And when I say America, I mean, that, that is in itself an interesting proposition because the state of California sometimes sounds like it is in some laws uh, representative of America as well, so you have all sorts of uh, layers to that. But um, I think there are, much like microphones, that we hold the political landscape. Um, and we've seen that in the United Nations. The fact that it's not just that it's a few making the decisions, it's actually a few that can block the decisions. And that is an interesting challenge if you want to talk philosophy as to how does democracy work. 
you know, you know, the idea is that if you have a majority vote, the rest kind of falls into place. That is actually how democracy works. So what if you can just go, I don't care what the majority thinks, it's just not going to happen. Whether that's a company or an individual, that would create an oligarchy on its own. And that could be, I think, a problem. I think that is when, um, when you sort of hijack systems and you throw massive spanners and wheels, and whether that, those interests are commercial with banks or with tech companies, whether they be political or in some other sphere, that's when the system really grinds down. That's an unfortunate thing. It actually inhibits evolution because the idea that everybody's going to agree on everything, seriously, that's just not going to happen. I think different national responses to technology probably reflect their own conception of their um, international position and the effectiveness of laws. So um, I've been following the, all the, the political dimension to the ATLC um, inquiry because um, there was a series of moves, a fairly, a fairly modest and very watered down proposal from the government, uh, the federal government, in response to a quite ambitious report from the Competition and Consumer Commission asking for a a rough piece between um, Google and Facebook and news media. And even the negotiation of the voluntary code proved to be too much for the tech giants, spurring the government to say, well, we're going to have a compulsory code, at which point the tech companies intervened directly and made an appeal to the Australian public. And at that point, it was a poorly big enough for our federal government politicians to say, hey, that's our job. Um, and to sort of have some terrain. But in that process, they had, they had you know, unfortunate bedfellows to some extent because they're working with News Limited. It kind of plays out in a particular way internationally as to who is really running that show. Um, so I think a lot of the stories of where um, countries have responded reflect a lot of the, the internal politics and the, the sense of law. Then my, my greatest confidence comes from, um, you mentioned the, um, um, Zero Basics, which is the Facebook platform that was used in India, and there's a grassroots response to digital colonialism through effectively providing a, for free a slim down version of the internet, for Facebook, was Facebook and a few other services. You had a real response, and then you had the courts um, respond about um, how we need to respond to platforms, and it was one of the most sophisticated responses I've seen. And the other are the tiny European nations, you know, the Belgians saying, well, when you, when you delete your Facebook account, for two years they maintain a shadow profile on you, and that's not all. And even though those rulings don't change, you, you gave the examples of changing international practice through one country's laws, I think there's still a, a, a sort of fervent belief that those decisions can be made and should be made by a, a tiny 25 person regulator that has charge of something like data protection. And you could get, you could imagine a snowball that if countries sort of work within the legal systems they have, but solve them, I think they walk at the power that they're confronting because they don't want to be shown up as being less powerful than the other Hands up the two. Okay, um, I guess we'll get to your question, but as to what Ed was saying, you could also argue that I guess the West has a monopoly on international law and even human rights, um, given that you have the West Valley and criticism but at the end of the day, we do have signatory states that have agreed to these standards. You can say, therefore, they should be applicable. But we'll move on now. Um, sorry, what was your name? I'm going to start uh, I'm a, somewhat of an interloper. I'm a technologist. I'm a tech director of the technical policy lab at Julia. Um, and I've been, um, have been privileged enough really to join the law school uh, only in the last few weeks. Um, but I have a question um, that's been rather interesting for me as someone who comes from 25 years of science and builds technology um, for the panel. Particularly, what has struck me um, in legal circles is when you talk about data and you talk about consent and you talk about privacy, there's a quite a significant component of that which is actually a constancy about talking about data at a distance. So you talk about data that you hand over there tends to be these conversations about, and I can choose to not enter my information into that data captured machine, whatever that is, whether it's a platform, etc. But it strikes me that the next five to ten years will be a period of time where the data that will be collected, that we will be talking about, will be about you. It will be biometric data. It will be data that is not necessarily something that you hand over at 
will, it will be data that is collected on Eli's face and I can tell his temperature and his heart rate or your capacity, Claire, to develop osteoarthritis or Dirk's capacity, probably, or propensity to develop knee or need a knee replacement in 10 years' time. Yeah, and I sell that to an insurer, for example, and, and, you know, and that impacts on your ability to then... And, and we know that all of these tech titans are currently collating and aggregating all of the information you're talking about today in order to build a profile about you that is actually much more individual than what we're talking about in terms of just data that we give away or information about ourselves. And I'm curious, particularly for Eli, actually, of how that might change as we move forward the legal profession's position regarding privacy and consent and all the things we're discussing today. Sorry. So, so I do think there's a difference between individualised data and group data. So being able to say you need a hip replacement or uh, is very different than saying, than saying statistically uh, male of one per senior age of this age uh, will require that at this, around this time or people seven years into a relationship are likely to get divorced or whatever it is that is statistical and we're just applying the statistical model to your life, right? Um, so there is a distinction between the two, where, as opposed to saying, I know your views of behavior patterns, that's individuated, right? Now, I understand when you do apply, like that, like the story of that Walmart case of the, of the pregnant girl, that you can't apply generic data to an individual case that's very accurately done, can be very personal in a sense, mm. right? Um, and, and so I understand that the, it, it's not, a, I'm not a purist in, in, in that distinction. I'm not, I, don't, I, I do acknowledge that there is a, a overlap. Um, but in terms of data collection, I think there should be that distinction. So when, when I don't, if, if you think of, of any item of clothing that you're wearing, or any, right, the, the company behind it has mentioned a thousand people, the blue, 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 and they've decided, you know, based on your category, this is the type of item that you might want to choose. That there is this sort of generic uh, data on frame of street tracking of cars that, that happens all the time. It's just that this becomes a bit, um, the, the, the level of, the, of the data collection and the amount of data that's available allows us to make very, very accurate predictions. And I think that's what becomes a bit scary. But, um, but still, the, the fundamental distinction between um, individual private data and some generic data, I think those, they should be treated uh, differently. Um, sorry, that's just a question on that thing that you've just said now. That's, it's not like a tangent, um, but the statistical data is made up of individual instances, right? So yes. at some point someone had to give, or it had to be taken, that individual data to form those. So it's, that's why that it's, 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 it's the linking of that to your profile. Is the issue of so if they, if, if they, so if it's anonymized, then that's acceptable, says you. I, I, would, I would say it's more acceptable, yes. Mm -hmm. That's my, my position. That, that basically, the anonymized or pseudo anonymized, or effectively pseudo anonymized, because it's linked to user number 12456, but who is user number 12456? Then I would need some sort of high level consent in order to match user 12456 to you. Yeah, it's informed by predictions, but it's like watching a video of you and, or watching you enter a room and you might grow um, uh, predictions based on that. I can tell Joe that's been into this room. I can tell Joe his likelihood of developing the osteoarthritis with about 84% accuracy, just from the video and things that he into this room. I think we'll see a move towards a um, a greater requirement for transparency, taking the GDPR, for example. You know, if, if information is being collected about you, you need to provide um, you know, free, free, uh, informed consent. Um, the, the purpose for which the information needs to be used uh, must be given. The information must only be used for that specific purpose and for a particular time, for a legitimate purpose. And, you know, if you 
don't, there are big fines attached attached to that. So I think we'll we'll see. Uh, thinking back, yeah, rewind a few years. You used to um, uh, see the website terms and conditions. But by using this website, you can go that you were a great artist and you're going to be bound by these terms. Now we've got the pop up, and you have to actively click. Um, I think that there will just be that move towards you know putting it right in front of your face, and this is exactly what we're doing, and this is how we're going to do it. And then you go to the I was waiting to my to leave it, because I've actually written a number of bits of advice on that in various contexts, so I'm very close to my area of practice. Um, really, your point is that data is just a footprint, so as I come in here, I will leave a footprint, and it, it really doesn't matter how it's connected, it becomes a footprint, and that is your issue. So. Um, let's say you have a big medical practice and they have 2,000 patients and somebody approaches them and says, look, we're going to do this wonderful research and we're going to create profiles um, because we want to do a study, we want to see you know, people living in this area more susceptible to this disease and so forth. Can we just depersonalise your data and suck it out of there and then we can create some profiles and do some wonderful things? And of course, as the data is proved, individual data comes in. So you've got a big area of concern for, you know, is the patient actually aware that if the medical practice were to release that data, uh, then within that grouping, profiles would be created, would actually like that to be created? Uh, is there some part in which it can be personalised again? So, if we take data collection right now, I'm going to talk about that social dilemma uh, show. Um, you might make an acquisition, you might buy a magazine here, and you buy a Fanta over there, then you don't go to the gym over here, you've got no track record of ever actually doing anything healthy. And these statistics can be compiled on you, and you can actually create and reverse, um, you can reverse engineer personal data. And that is one of the big concerns in all of this. At which point in time does that actually become offensive? The problem with the law is the law is like the Titanic, it moves very slowly. You know, oh, look, it's a little bit of white stuff hanging out of the water. Is this a problem? No, no, this is the biggest ship ever. Just give it a little willy and we should be okay. And of course, it wasn't. So we can sink us in this process. And if you take my views of dystopia, I'm not just uh, the American version of freedom, but the Chinese version of let's digitise everything, because you walk into a shop, and uh, not only does it take your profile of what you buy and makes available, you know, various digital forms of payment, but you also tap into a system of social ranking. And if they don't like what you do by their standard, you're not going to be able to travel on a plane. You might have to give donations out of your salary for three months in a row, before you're allowed to travel on a plane again. You might only be able to travel on a bus. So there's actually now uh, sanctions beyond putting you into a concentration camp or so. They just d deprive you of essential living. So where law, I think, falls down is that you put a lot of us guys into a room, particularly my age, and sort of, hur, 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 and, uh, you know, I'm a Luddite, and there's sort of these badges of honours that they have. People don't know how to use their lap uh, laptop or their, their phones, and I've always been a bit suspicious of all of that. I think as lawyer, and you, your generation in particular, you need to actually get a broad education. You need to um, acquaint yourself with a lot of things. You, you know, take your average good commercial silk. Uh, they're an expert in just about everything. I, I can tell you more about size of rope now than you ever want to know. I can tell you about how plastics deform and not deform because I've done product liability claims on this. Um, uh, so I've acquired all sorts of bizarre factual knowledge, which kind of goes in and then sort of flows out. But this is the point about the challenge for law being more than something that just narrowly looks into a book and reacts to a thing. As lawyers, we are enforcers of social norms. We need to have be part of the discourse of what those norms are. If we are to contribute to the drafting of legislation, we need to know what the future is. And that means we need to understand the thing we make rules over. You know, there's a lot of parliamentarians voting on laws that they actually don't understand. They don't even they don't understand the language. You know, it, it, it's, it's too complicated. I open a tax act would be a great example of that. Um, uh, and people do need to do this: zoom out, go back to the basics, break it down, have robust conversations, intelligent conversations, not the sort of screaming and yelling that people do these days. But go, do you know, by the way, when they start to collect and make the points that you make. And then it says the other side, well, there's, there's another bite, we can see this with, with coronavirus right now. So you have people collecting data and actually becoming somewhat moronic in the process, going, well, if you are in this group, the virus will affect you as follows. And there's a lot of 74-year-olds who had the coronavirus go, actually, it wasn't too bad, because 
there's inflammatory responses, and there's this and that. There's all sorts of things that are variations to it. So, for instance, a 10-year-old with diabetes is more likely to die than a 74-year-old with great vascular system and robust constitution, possibly, because of the vascular issues that involves the clotting issues and so forth. Um, and I think then you make more responsible um, decisions. So part of the responsibility of law is to rise and to acquaint itself with the different things that are fired at it and to get more breadth in, in our education. And part of the obligation of science, and I think science is failing us right now, is that it has a much better debate and say, no, no, these people need to shut up. Um, this is how it works. And I think that actually is far more unifying. You'll find people will respond quite well. If you do what the Swiss do, which is not vote in accordance with political party lines, but on issues, um, and you explain those issues well, I think you have a better society, but that's just, that's probably me straying into the esoteric. I've lived in Switzerland do like the coming direct to the decision making. I guess having been um, privy to some of Jack's scientific research, I think it's a, a real shift. We had a shift, what, the first shift was five, six years ago with um, Internet of Things, embedded sensor networks, uh, and the reality that you are in physical environments like Amazon Echo, you know, Google Home, these devices that do come into your private space. It truly terrifies me that Facebook has a, bio, um, a biomechanics, musculoskeletal modeling lab based on videos of you. No, like, statistics of 50 years ago. This is, like, as, as close as it gets to replicating you and making predictions on you. And I don't think we have time for the law to sit around and hope that it can deal with it. Um, so I'll give you a heads up what Jackie and I are working on, is we're thinking about where is the frontier of human monitoring for monetization? And it's in elite sport, where you have 24 on 7 data collection all the time, everything from what happens in the bedroom to what happens on the field. No rules, no laws, no sense of privacy, no ethics, no nothing, because we want broadcasters and fans and everyone to, to play there. But sport's also a domain where we have lots of social norms, where we have ideas of fair play, where we regulate performance enhancement. We have lots of tools that we can draw on. So we're going to use sport over the next year as a template for how we think about those biometrics issues that I don't think we can get. We can't understand what Facebook's doing with it. And it's a bloody hard thing to think about attacking. But they are learning from the sport domain. And they're learning from people's acceptance of you know, men running around in sports bars with trackers in them and no one having any issue about where it goes to say, well, maybe we all are getting pretty close to that as a society. So if anyone wants to be part of that project over the next year, tell them to shout to us in the lab. <laughs> I think we perhaps will dedicate another event to biometric issues. Um, super interesting. Um, maybe time for t two short questions because we are running out of time. Um, Rupert. Yes, that's true. <laughs> um, very brief thoughts from everyone on the panel on what where really is the most heat? You know, what specifically worries you the most about this very big issue? You know, is it a like a rights-based issue? Is it a violation of privacy? Or you know, there's been brief discussions of taking power away from state actors and the imbalance of power. Or um, is it about uh, undermining political discourse? Or you know, the nature of what it means to have a human identity to um, you know, where specifically for each of the panellists is the heat and what specifically is, is the issue in its simple terms? Before I pass it on, I guess, from my vantage point, it's the death of privacy as well as the creation of this super intelligence that we're unable to control and that's so advanced and um, has been created due to infringement of data rights. But um, whoever wants to comment on that. Me, it's the we don't know what we don't know. That that's what that's what scares me. Um, I, I think an AI that's capable of understanding emotions is pretty scary because uh, AI is in terms of, of how play and processes and calculations and decision points is is ten thousand times faster and better at than us. The one advantage we have over the robots is our ability to move for nuance, for judgment, for feelings. And what we've done is we built 
captures that nuance, and captures that soft part, soft part of humanity, and converts it to digital form. And so then you have this AI that's basically a, a super powerful data that is capable of understanding everything, including the most soft elements, the, 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 the human emotion part of this. Um, so I think that's a, I think Elon Musk kind of is this great sensor. So I'll be going there. The rise of stupidity. Um, <laughs> you know, Asimov actually said something very profound in the 80s. He said there's a rise of anti-intellectualism. I mean, he made it America specific. But he said, you know, your ignorance is now as good as my uh, knowledge. And that's the American version of democracy. Don't paraphrase it. Don't paraphrase it. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm not focusing on America, but I think that generally uh, people are dumbing down. I think that the choices we make are becoming simpler. You look at the 1960s, you look at Star Trek Enterprise, which I'm a big fan of, hence my whole consumer thing. But I, um, you know, it, it, everything became so noble when you were there. People go, oh, we can go to space, we can do this, we can, you know, make the world better and so forth. And we still have kids um, in bare feet running through vats of chemicals which will kill them, making you a $5 t shirt. Um, 6,000 litres of water being used for a pair of pants. What, one issue? There's a myriad of, myriad of issues. And we've lost the capacity to form a bigger picture capacity for how we want to live. You know, the fact that you're eating food label is one thing, it doesn't have that in there. The fact that a luxury label can run around saying these letter, letters are ethically treated and fair trade, blah, 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 blah. And that goes to the first supply, but the guy that's actually washing the letters, dyeing and doing all of that, is using slave labor. The fact that your tomatoes come out of China and Italy and you've killed the Ghanese tomato industry. The fact that we recycle clothes by actually chucking them back into Africa and killing their economies, they are all the things that trouble me deeply. So whether I'm a raving this or that, I rant a lot about these things. But the problem is they're all slipping under because nobody really bothers to do anything. And if you do, you are labelled as this or that. And so important conversations get lost. And this is in particular for lawyers, the people who have the power to make a change. We need to inform ourselves, we need to start educating, and we need to start accepting that lives are not easy, they're complicated, and they need depth, they need thought, and they need four eye like this, where people just spit more stuff around. And we can disagree, that's okay, that's just normal. And at university, you should be high parking, <laughs> you should be on your soapbox about everything. This is where you test all your ideas robustly, and you build a better society. You get into that. Um, I would like to know what you think um, of what, what, what gives the most heat. I mean, I think it is, it's the unchecked power question. So I actually think most of the claims about singularity or um, you know, robot takeover are always cast just beyond our lifetime so that no one has to be accountable for their predictions. But the only reason we worry about them is if we can't handle the companies that are developing the cars. And right now we can't handle them. So, that's where I put my attention for the big tech companies in today. What do you think, Rebecca? You really wasn't expecting to have a very turn around. <laughs> um, well, I asked the question because it seems like such an amorphous issue is very difficult to pin down. So my opening remark would be to say, don't know, and I think that's why I've asked. But, um, yes, sitting on the fence very effectively there. I mean, I'm down in the front row. Um, yeah, I mean, there's something somewhat alluring about uh, the uh, focusing on, you know, the singularity of all four questions, of existential questions of what the significance of technology means for uh, human identity. That's, like, very interesting. But I also, uh, I find the argument that you raised about uh, you need to address, um, you know, what's a necessary step to get to that point is um, that technology getting out of hand. And why is it currently out of hands? Because the corporations that are um, that set the narrative aren't being effectively regulated. So maybe that's yeah. that will be my answer. When when we were debating this, I mentioned that little Facebook oversight board and how do you deal with this plethora of issues? Maria Resso is a um, Filipino journalist. Said you've got to go for the causes, otherwise you're always going to be just like stamping out what, what effects. So one of the causes is you know how do we educate people? How do we have civilized debate? How do we have structures for for um, civic discourse? Um, I think that a lot of the tech you know tech issues feel so out of hand because there are a few number, a few layers, 
and they aren't being touched. Um, but the fact that there's only a few, and they are very different, tech always feels a bit too much of a fuzzy label for the entirely different operations of Amazon and Google and Apple. Um, but I think focusing on the particular causes that they are stimulating and, and, and what you would do about them feels like it, for me, it contains the, the field somewhat. Um, I know we're past on a few book recommendations, but on the topic of super intelligence, there's a book called, entitled Super Intelligence Paths, Dangers and Strategies by Nick Bostrom, who is currently a force for the University of Oxford. Um, it's a really interesting book to read for those interested. Um, is there any, any other questions before we wrap up? I think I'll just you, you can say some more questions before we all come here at the front and let you do one on Absolutely. You know, we are running out of time. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Profi, if you have a question, maybe speak to one of the panels. I'm just going to remember that she said speak to panels. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. That was for the